Hey there and welcome back to NBA 2K18. My name is Pete and today we complete another part of our first season with the Louisville Legionnaires and I have a feeling things are about to get a bit more interesting, if not for us then at least for the rest of the league, as we are less than a month away from the trade deadline. The Legionnaires themselves only have 13 games left to play until they can no longer make a trade and I would say let's jump right into the first one, or at least to the end of it, a matchup against the Memphis Grizzlies. And we start off the episode strong with a victory in Memphis, apart from a pretty mediocre second quarter this game always in our hands, and if we look at the box score no surprises here either, Josh Richardson once again our top scorer, this time also with a double-double he managed to grab 10 rebounds to go along with his 19 points. Another double-double as well as 4 blocks for Deontay Davis, while Farrell, Hewlis, Hernan Gomez and Johnson also all scored in double digits. So, one game down, up next we're going up against the Brooklyn Nets, who have sadly lost D'Angelo Russell to a season-ending injury. This is of course bad news for Russell and the Nets, but it should make things a bit easier for us. However, before we can actually get into the game, a rather high-profile trade offer here. The Mavericks looking to acquire Dwight Howard and a second rounder from the Hornets, in exchange for Wesley Matthews and Jeff Withy. With this move, the Mavericks would get rid of Matthews' rather large player option next season, but it would also leave them incredibly thin at the shooting guard. The loss of Jeff Withy doesn't hurt them too much if they get Dwight Howard back in return, however I'm more or less sure the Hornets would decline this trade offer, simply because losing Howard would leave their already pretty thin big man rotation even thinner, and it also adds another shooting guard on a team that already has four of those. So I don't really think this trade is particularly attractive for either side, and that is why we're going to decline it. From the Hornets' perspective alone, I think it would take them a bit more to give up Dwight Howard. The game against the Nets then actually an unsurprisingly competitive one, with the Nets actually having the upper hand with only a few minutes left on the clock. With less than two and a half minutes left to play, Josh Richardson able to cut the lead down to one, with points number 16 and 17. On the other end then, beautiful defense by Deontay Davis blocking Spencer Dinwiddie's shot attempt, however unable to convert the easy layup in the following fast break. Then things repeat themselves, Dinwiddie drives to the basket one more time and Davis blocks the shot again, this time though we take it a bit slower on offense, until Tyler Hewlis is able to beat his man for the easy layup that he also misses. Two free throws for Rondé Hollis Jefferson then put the Nets back up by three, and out of the following timeout we have a good open shot with Josh Richardson, however he misses and not only that, Hernan Gomez commits another foul going for the rebound, and that gives Trevor Booker two more free throws who makes one and puts the team up by four. Then Richardson once again messes up with a stupid pass that leads to a turnover, and we have no other chance but to foul here, and at that point the game pretty much out of reach. Now Dinwiddie missed a second free throw here, and so I thought that maybe there was still a tiny chance, but Richardson once again misses the three-pointer from the corner, and soon after Dinwiddie is at the line again, and even though he once again misses one shot and Hernan Gomez also hits another three-pointer, all of that happens just a tiny bit too late for us to turn things around, and so in the end we lose to the Nets 107-104. Richardson, Harkless and Farrell are our top performers with 17 points each, and there's one more guy to mention, Deontay Davis, who just set the franchise record for most rebounds in a single game with 14. Now immediately on the following day another game against the Magic, but before we can get to that we are being offered a trade, and a very interesting one to say the least. The Hornets, apparently hell-bent on getting rid of Dwight Howard, offer him to us for Josh Richardson and a second-round draft pick, and as tempting as that offer is, especially since it makes absolutely no sense for the Hornets, we are going to decline this one. Yes, Dwight Howard is certainly a tier above Richardson at the moment and he could be our first star player, but he also doesn't really help us in any way whatsoever, since we are still quite a few years away from being a contender, and that also doesn't change whether or not we make this move. And also, since we just signed Richardson to a 4-year contract extension, I have no intentions of trading him anytime soon. Against the Magic then a somewhat decisive loss with no one really standing out, so let's move on to our first matchup of the season against the San Antonio Spurs. Once again we are being interrupted before we can get to the game itself, our scout has finished his job and needs new assignments, so let's quickly give him those, and then we're also presented with another trade to look at. The Suns want to move Brandon Knight and Jared Dudley off to Atlanta, who are willing to give up Kent Basemore and rookie John Collins in return. And I have a few problems with this trade, starting in Phoenix. 
Now, looking at Brandon Knight's contract, it is certainly understandable why the Suns would want to move him. However, doing so in a trade that does not give them another point guard in return would be absolutely catastrophic for the rotation. With Devin Booker currently injured and two subpar players at the rest of the shooting guard positions, I don't really see who could fill in for Knight once he's gone. Atlanta, on the other hand, has absolutely no need to acquire a $14 million point guard to play second fiddle behind Dennis Schroeder, and considering the fact that they are in full rebuild mode, I also can't see them part ways with John Collins. Now, getting rid of Basemore's contract would certainly be something, but not if you get an equally bad contract in return. Right now, I actually think this trade would hurt both teams, so I once again decided to decline it. Against the Spurs, then a blowout, but not in the way I had expected. Apart from losing the first quarter by 5 points, we absolutely dominated the rest of the game, and so finished this one with a 20-point victory at home. Yogi Ferrell, our scoring leader with 19 points, but the man of the match, without a doubt, Deontay Davis. 10 points, a career and franchise high 17 rebounds, as well as 3 blocks completed stat line tonight, and I think it's absolutely safe to say that he was feasting inside. Next game, then against the Boston Celtics, a team that we have one win and one loss against, and just like in the previous two games, the Celtics still without Gordon Hayward, who is recovering from strained right Achilles, and also without Al Horford, who fractured his right hand. So maybe another easy one here, we'll see about that in a minute, but first, there is another trade to approve. This one, a straight-up player swap between the Mavericks and the Nets, Brooklyn understandably looking to part ways with Timothy Moskov's monster contract, while Dallas is hoping to unload an expiring contract in Josh McRoberts here. Now, to be honest, the trade once again doesn't make much sense to me. Moskov at this point is more a burden than an asset, and if I'm the Mavericks and if I wanted to get rid of McRoberts, I would just let him walk at the end of the season here. For Brooklyn, this one's an absolute steal, but I would have to think, unless one of Brooklyn's picks is involved, the Mavericks say no in this case. And I hate to be this harsh because I definitely want the CPU to make trades in this playthrough, it's just that the trade offers we've been presented with so far were more or less all hot garbage. Off screen, I actually increased the trade frequency slider a bit, and this should make trades even more frequent for the next few days, and who knows, maybe we'll find the occasional good one in there. A good one, such as maybe this one. The Trailblazers looking to acquire Boban Majanovic and Reggie Bullock from the Pistons in exchange for Myers Leonard and Jake Lehman. All the players involved, rather low profile targets, but let's have a closer look. For the Pistons, Majanovic currently somewhat important as the backup center of the bench, while Bullock is not playing that much of a role as the third string small forward. Acquiring another power forward in Myers Leonard could work and help take the load of Brandon Bass, who could move from the backup power forward to the backup center of the bench and fill in for Boban Mojanovic. Now, Portland very likely using this move to get rid of Leonard and his $30 million contract, while the acquisition of Mojanovic could be a smart move as well, since both Nurkic and Ed Davis are expiring. All in all, I would rate this trade heavily in favor of the Trailblazers, but since the Pistons are currently slightly overperforming, this might help bring them back to earth, and it's also not a trade that drastically changes anyone's roster. So I think we can, although barely, agree to this one, and then finally move on to our game against Boston. And this one once again incredibly close, the Legion S holding on to a small one-point lead with only two minutes left to play, despite both Hayward and Harford sitting this one out. Off of Monte Ellis' miss, then we go the other way, where we have, once again, Josh Richardson scoring, who puts the Legionnaires up by three. On the following possession, then, the Celtics turn over the ball, it goes back to Richardson, who scores again, and all of a sudden we have a somewhat comfortable five-point lead. On the other end, Kyrie Irving hits a long two to get the Celtics back within three, and with one minute left to play, we take a timeout to talk things over. Fresh out of the timeout, we get the ball in the post to Juan Heron Gomez, who misses the hook shot, but Deontay Davis grabs the offensive rebound and we can milk the clock a bit more. However, we take things slightly too far and so more Harkless is forced to take a desperation three-pointer, but once again it's Deontay Davis to the rescue, kicking the ball out to Tyler Hudis, and the Celtics have no other option but to foul. And Hudis makes both free throws, puts us back up by five, and now the Celtics decide to take a timeout. Now, we know Boston will likely go for the three-pointer here, so Harkless is doing a good job defending that. However, then the ball goes to Kyrie Irving and Tyler Hewlett is just a split second late, and that is just enough time for Irving to drill the three and make things a lot more interesting. And things remain that way, because what follows are the inevitable free throws for Tyler Hewlett, who only manages to make one of two. 
the Celtics take a timeout, we make a few substitutions, bringing in Richardson to defend Kyrie Irving and also putting in Joe Chi down low next to Deontay Davis. And this lineup does its job, Kyrie Irving immediately gets rid of the ball off the inbound pass. It ends up with a well-defended Jason Tatum in the corner, who misses the three to send the game to overtime, and so the Legionnaires take this one. And this guy right here, Kyrie Irving with 39 points, but not enough to secure his team the victory, while on our side the top scorer, this man right here, Mo Harkless, who had 19 points. Other noteworthy performances, Josh Richardson with 17 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists and 3 steals. And especially the rebounding numbers have been very strong these last few games. So Richardson definitely developing into a very solid all-around player. And then the guy who pretty much saved us down the line, Deontay Davis with 2 huge offensive rebounds. In the end he finished with only 6 points and 8 rebounds, but with 2 steals and 2 blocks as well. And who knows, maybe a few years down the line, if he can keep those steal numbers up, Deontay Davis may be a candidate for Defensive Player of the Year. Before the game against the Nuggets, we have three days off, and so the next trade offer isn't too far away. And not considering the second round draft picks, this one pretty much the straight up swat of Marcus Morris for Tyler Eulis, a trade offer that we can swiftly decline, and then proceed with a decision regarding Marcelo Huertas. The amount of time he can spend with us on his two day contract has sadly run out, and so we now either have to cut him loose or return him to the G League. And since I don't believe that at 34 years old Huertas has any place in a development league, let's just release him to free agency again, maybe someone else will pick him up for the remainder of the season. In the next game against the Denver Nuggets, the recently traded Davis Bertans and Tyler Leiden face up against each other, and in the end, Bertans and his new squad have the upper hand. Bertans himself did not play, so the matchup goes in favor of Leiden, who produces 4 points and 3 rebounds in 13 minutes of action, while Mo Harkless leads the squad in scoring with 18 points and 5 rebounds. Now the trade deadline is only two weeks away, and before we continue, I would once again like to hear your input. I already talked about trading for a late first, but rather an early second round draft pick, and the guy that I currently have in mind to be traded is Sheldon Mack. Mack has so far spent his entire career with the Legionnaires in the G League, and with Richardson, Abrinas and Vaughn in the rotation ahead of him, I don't really see that change anytime soon. At the same time, he has a full guaranteed contract and is therefore keeping us from signing another veteran free agent while at the same time not occupying a spot in the rotation. My idea would be to simply move him to a team that is a bit short on shooting guards at the moment and in exchange demand a second round pick for the 2018 draft. Other than that, I don't really see any obvious trades at the moment, but feel free to also let me know your thoughts on Yogi Ferrell. Currently, Farrell and Eulis are head-to-head -head performance wise, with Farrell even beating Eulis in some stats despite lower playing time, but other than Eulis, Farrell is on an expiring contract, and he could also be worth a draft pick to a team that desperately needs help at the point guard. At the moment, and also depending on who we draft, I think we might risk things with him in free agency, but let me know your thoughts anyway, there were some pretty good arguments last time, and you guys mentioned a lot of things that I hadn't even thought about. So those would be my two questions for you to wrap this episode up. So let me know down below in the comments what you think. As always, if you like this video, then leave a thumbs up. And of course, if you want to support this channel, then feel free to subscribe. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.